See that little gadget up there, Tannis? Yeah, I've seen those in my school and in office buildings. Where? Well, in the hallways and in the classrooms. Up, up in the ceiling like yeah, that? Yeah, on the yeah. ceiling. What are they for? Um, they're sprinklers for, for the fires. In case the fire starts. Yeah. Have you ever seen one go off? No, I've never seen one of those go Well, wouldn't it be before. a good idea to set one off? Yeah, I'd like to see that. Well, that's why I brought all this outside. You, you know Marty, the guy living down the block with the beard? Yeah, I've well, seen I, him Well, I uh, borrowed the stand from him so that mm -hmm. I could set the sprinkler up here, pretend it's a ceiling. Oh. Now I've got it hooked up to the garden hose. Mm -hmm. So when the fire gets up here, that little silver section up there mm -hmm. is a special combination of metals that the engineers can mix to make it melt mm -hmm. at any temperature they want. That one's set at 160 degrees. So the minute it gets 160 degrees, it's going to fall away, and that will release this thing, and out will come water and hopefully put out the fire. Yeah, OK. Ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. OK, I'll take, one of, I'll take this match here. All right. Just light it about right there. OK. And see if we can set off a ceiling sprinkler. OK. There you go. OK, now let's get out of the way, because if okay. it gets off, we don't want to get wet. OK. See, as soon as the plug up above melts, it gets, it's knocked out of the way, and then the water coming out of there hits that little, uh, see that round thing up on top that looks like yeah. a sort of flower? And that yeah. sprays the water out in all directions. Now, I've just got hose pressure on it so it doesn't go out very far. In a real building, it could um. go out 15 feet and spray everything Put yeah, the if the fire's all spread out, then yeah. all the water would get to it and put it out. Right. Yeah, that's neat. That's the first time I've ever seen that happen. Mm. Now you know how a ceiling sprinkler puts out a fire. Yeah. Jason, here's a candle sitting in a dish. It's got some water in the bottom. Okay. That's going to act as a seal to seal off the bottom of this cylinder. Part way up in the cylinder is a hole with a cork in it, see? Yeah. Then the rest of the cylinder is all nice and solid, except when you get to the top, where I have a plastic cap and a hole in that and a cork in the hole. OK. okay? Now, I assume you know something about what makes a candle burn, so I have some sort of tricky little questions. First okay. of all, I want you to take the cylinder just as it is, put it over the candle, and predict what's going to happen. Well, if I put the cylinder over the candle, the cylinder, it'll be airtight because of the water sealing the bottom. And since there won't be any more oxygen, the candle will use it all and it'll go out okay, when it runs out. Okay, go ahead out. and do it. See all if right. you're right. Not going out, but wait, 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 what, what? Well, it just has to use it all uh, up. Right, okay. First prediction was okay. Okay. Now, take the cylinder out. Take out the bottom cork. All right. And I'll light the candle again. Okay. Okay, now you're going to put it on again. Predict what's going to happen. This time, hole down below, no hole at top. Hmm. Well, it'll be getting oxygen, so it'll keep going this time. Okay. Put it on. Hmm. Why did it go out? Well, in order for oxygen to get there, you have to get rid of what the waste product of the combustion, which is what? Carbon dioxide. Right. When you filled the thing up with carbon dioxide, no more air could get in. Okay, okay, then predict. Go ahead, take it off again. I'll light the candle. This time, take out the little stopper from the top. Okay, now mm -hmm. what? Here. In here. No? No? Okay. Just leave it out all together. All right. So you have a hole at the top, hole at the bottom. Now it'll keep going. You think it will? Wait, wait till my candle gets burning here all for right. a minute. Okay. Okay, it'll keep going now. Okay, why is it keeping going now? Pardon me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's getting oxygen in there, and the hole on top is letting it out. It depends on, it depends on how big that hole is. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. That, 
Yeah. Now, what happened? You just it's were gonna... dying out. Yeah, it's dying out. Why? Well, maybe the carbon dioxide isn't getting out fast enough. Right. Either the air is not coming in fast enough or the carbon dioxide is not going out fast enough. Well, we'll find out. Take the top off, quick. It's coming back uh -huh. again. It's coming back again. So it was the supply of carbon dioxide that was slowing down the flame. So what makes the candle burn, Jason? Well, you've got to give the candle a constant supply of oxygen, but you've also got to get rid of the carbon dioxide to give room for new oxygen right. to come in. Very good. This looks like a space probe sent from Earth to explore the surface of a planet, but it's not. It's a T4 virus that could be inside of you right now, not making you sick, but attacking bacteria in your intestinal tract. The virus injects its own DNA, stored in the part at the top, into a bacterium through the long tube. About half an hour after the virus has landed, the bacterium is destroyed and new T4s are released to attack more bacteria. Top to bottom, it measures only five millionths of an inch. You like card tricks, Lila? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to show you one that makes a very important scientific point. Here, uh, typically, you know, take a card, like a typical card trick. Take a look at it. Got it? Yeah. Okay. Put it back in the deck. Okay. Even shuffle it a couple of times. Now, I will simply put it behind my back, like this. That's your card? Yeah. How'd you do that? Well, I told you it made a very important scientific point. First of all, just measure the card for me. How long is it? Eight and a half. Okay, how wide right. is it? Six centimeters. Six centimeters, you sure? Yeah. You measure that pretty carefully? Mm hmm Okay, then I have another thing for you to do. Come on around over here to the edge. And what I'd like you to do is start here like this, put this card right like that, put the next one to it, and make sure the edges touch and go right along the edge here like that. Okay. Now, when I ask you to measure the card, you sort of measured it like you do in everyday life. You measured the length once and you measured the width once, right? Mm-hmm. But scientists, if they're going to be doing measurements and they're going to be added up like what you're doing, they would be very careful. What's the matter? What's, it, there's something wrong with these cards. Keep going, put a couple more down. They would measure the cards very carefully. They'd measure maybe several lengths and several widths because when you make a slight error and begin to add up those errors, the errors add up too. What's the matter with those cards? One side is longer or one side is shorter. Well, wider or narrower, you mean? Yeah. Right. Well. In other words, this side must be longer because it's bending like that. If you put 52 cards, it'd go way over there someplace. So what do you suspect as a matter? This, this side is, is narrower. Smaller. Okay, now it really doesn't make too much difference when you're playing cards, is it what, whether one side is longer or not, or shorter. But if you were a scientist and you were doing measurements that might send somebody to the moon, and you made an error, uh, a tiny small error that was going to repeat it, like for every mile that you went up to the moon, miss the moon, right? So yeah. scientists are really very careful about their measurements. You think you can do the trick now? Yeah. Okay, okay. you play it on me this time. Take a card. Take a card, okay. Ten of spades. Now you're going to turn that deck around. Okay? Now if I put it in the same way, like that, now wrap the cards on the table to make sure they're nice. See, what, see it? See it? It's taller. Yeah, so now what do you do? Okay, now I'll go like this. There you go. And ten of ten spades. Ten of spades. Very good. Can you do that with a regular deck of cards? No, you need a special deck called a stripper deck, which you buy at a magic shop to have fun with. But I wanted to make that important scientific point that when you're going to measure something, you must do it very accurately and precisely. Tannis, you've worked with a computer before. Yes, yeah. I have. So you know that inside here is a uh, central processing unit and that you can access it by the keyboard and so forth. And have you plugged in little cartridges like this? Yeah, I have. What are yours? Um, game cartridges. Game cartridges. Well, this one is sort of a different than a game cartridge in that when you put it in, it changes the characteristic of the computer to make it into a palette 
for an artist to be able to do beautiful pictures, and you are the artist. Oh, okay. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. You, you plug it in on the side, right, like this? Yeah. Okay. And then you turn, uh, turn it on. And up there, you've seen a main menu like this before? Yeah. And notice I have it on both of my television sets, so we can yes. look at the great big one or the little one. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's try quad drawing. So what okay. do you have to push? Q. Q. Okay. And then return. And now you see that little dot in the center of the screen? Yeah. I'll hold down the button and you work the joystick because you will get an idea then what quad drawing is. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, that looks really neat. You know what the word quad means? Yeah, four. Four. So you're drawing with four lines all at once. And as you change direction, you're changing color. What are you drawing? I don't uh, know. Butterfly with square wings. <laughs> so you can have fun doing that sort of thing, but that isn't what I really wanted to show you. I wanted to show you another one. Go back to the main menu, which means mm -hmm. M, return. See the one, P, painting? Yeah. Okay, first erase. Okay. E, return, and now P. Okay, now there it says P1. See it, painting one? That's all right, just yep. leave it there. Just hit return, and you'll have the first attempt at painting. Okay. There's number one. Oh, it's really colorful. Isn't it? Yeah. And they feed back on them, watch them all meet in the center. Crunch. Making a whole new one. Yeah, when they meet in the center, the colors go different. Yeah, the colors are changed. That's painting one. How would you like to try three? Okay. How to do it by now. P, three, there we go. Oh, that one looks nice. That's not my favorite. I think it's too jumbled. Well, I have a couple of surprises for you. I would like you to try number six because that's my favorite. See if you like it okay. too. Okay. P, six, enter. Well, I like this one the best too. You do? Okay. Yeah. Well, now let's look at it that way for a while. Notice that we have what colors? Black, red, green, but the background is black. Yeah. Okay, if you take the joystick, push it just a little bit, you can change the colors. Oh, wow, the colors really Yeah, yeah. not different. too fast, just... There's a nice green one. Yeah. yeah it's... Anyway, the computer is really quite a... <clears throat> uh, has an interesting palette. And by the way, imagine how complicated that must be for the programmer who actually programmed that. Yeah. And someday you'll probably be able to do programming like that if you keep it up. Yeah, I hope so. You wouldn't think that animals that live in the forest would be helped by a forest fire, but they can be. You see, after the fire is out, Burned areas often reseed themselves naturally with grass that grows quickly and is the favorite food of Rocky Mountain elk. Would this new supply of food be good for the elk herd? To find out, scientists began an intensive study of the elk that moved into a burned and reseeded area near the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico. They captured elk in a specially designed trap. With a hypodermic syringe at the end of a long pole, they injected a powerful drug into the animal. As soon as the drug took effect, they attached a collar with a small built-in radio transmitter. Each collar radio broadcast at a different frequency. When the elk recovered, it returned to join the herd in the wild. With a directional antenna, they tuned into each radio tag elk and recorded its location every week. When it was difficult to get into the high country, they followed the elk with an aeroplane, equipped with a directional antenna under each wing. When all this information was fed into a computer, the scientists could see how the herd moved from week to week. Watch what the elk did when a heavy snowstorm hit the high country. They all moved to the burned and receded area and stayed there most of the winter. This part of the study showed that the receded area definitely attracted more elk than the unburned range. Next, they recaptured the animals with the radio collars. They weighed them to find out if they were getting enough of the right kind of food. They also measured the fat along the backbone, an indication of how much food energy the animal had stored. They took tissue and blood samples for later analysis. Preliminary findings 
indicate the elk are in good health. The Los Alamos study of the elk herd will be valuable to other scientists. They'll be able to predict, rather than guess, how fire or man-made changes will affect the animals that live in the forest, and thus help preserve valuable wildlife, including the Rocky Mountain elk. Stacy, let's take a look at how you see. I have all kinds of sort of simple things that we can test how your eyes really work. First thing I want you to do is look across the room over there. Okay. And I, can you tell what I have in my hand? Uh, a watch? Mm -hmm. What time is it? I can't read it. No. Now I'll slowly bring it up because now you're looking at it only with your so-called peripheral vision, what you can see out of the side of your eye. Can you f see the movement? Yeah. Yeah, the fact that I'm moving it you can see, but you can, still can't read the time. No. Okay, I'll bring it around over here. 25 after 4. Yeah. Does that seem strange? It. Even though you can yes. see it over here. So you have two different kinds of vision for, for first place. When you look straight forward, you can th see things in great detail, but on the sides, you can't. No. Have you noticed that before? Yeah, you can just see, like, if somebody's walking towards you from the back. Mm-hmm or um, things that are just staying there. You know what they call, they, people use the expression out of the corner of my eye. Yeah. Yeah, there really isn't a corner. Well, then you also can't see as well as you think. Here uh, are two little things which I have glued to this piece of plastic. Look at, uh, here, hold it. Okay. And look at this square with that eye and move this back and forth and see if you can't get that little triangle to disappear. A little further out, I think. Okay. Gone? Yeah. Right there? It yeah. Disappears. Try with the other eye. Now, when you look at it with your right eye, look at the little triangle. Does the square disappear? Right here. There. I told you you couldn't see too well. <laughs> the reason you can't is because all the images that are uh, <clears throat> receiving by your eye are focused on the back of your eye. And right there is your optic nerve that sends all these images to your brain. And right at that spot, you have a blind spot. Oh. Everybody does. Like a blind spot in a car? Well, sort of. A blind spot in a car is sort of where a post is sticking up or something. Oh. In this case, it's because of your optic nerve. Now, are you right-eyed or left-eyed? Well, I'm right-handed, so I must be right-eyed then. Well, we'll see. Here's okay. a way you can find out. Here I have a vice in which I put a ruler. Ground and stand over here and look okay. across the room and line up the room divider with the, the edge of the room divider with the yardstick using both eyes. Okay. Okay, is so it lined up? Okay, now close one eye. Jumped back and forth. Okay, now which one? Close one eye first. One of them is going to be lined up, I think. It's lined up with this eye. Yeah. So even though you use two eyes, you favored the right one when you tried to line up something like that. But when I open my left eye, it jumps this way. Sure. But why, if my left side's on well, this side? Well, first of all, you're looking way across the room, right? Yeah. Okay, so you're looking at two angles like this. You're focusing way over there. So you first see this, and then you see this. Oh. Yeah. So you're okay. right-eyed, yeah. so your favorite one. Then, <clears throat> let me put this down out of the way again. Then you also, well, let me try it first. I don't know if you've ever seen through your hand here. No. Take this tube, take it to hold the tube okay. like that, and put that on one eye. And then put your hand up here like this, like that. Keep both eyes open now. What do you see? There's a hole through my hand. It looks like it, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Why, would, why would you see a hole through your hand when you look through a tube? Well, maybe because your mind is combining both images. Mm -hmm. Your brain is combining them, yeah. In other words, this eye is seeing one image, your hand, and the other eye is seeing the hand, and your, your brain is combining the two. So your brain combines the two images all the time, but you just don't notice it until you do something like that. Here's another trick that's kind of fun. Have you ever done this? Hold your fingers up and look across the room like this. Yes, I have. Okay, and what do you see in the middle? A floating finger. Yeah. <laughs> Some people call it a little frankfurter. Just hold up your, look across the room and hold your two fingers up and you see a little floating finger there. Again, the idea that you're using, that your, your brain is combining those two images to make the little floating finger. Yeah. Then finally, here's, here's the last one, probably one of the most important attributes of your eyes, the fact that you have two of them at the front of your head. Here, take this pencil okay. and this pencil and bring them together rather quickly using one eye. Now, wait a minute, one okay. eye. Yeah. 
Now, now use two eyes. Okay. Relatively easy. Yeah. There. <laughs> okay. So I told you we were going to look at how you see. How do you see? Well, <clears throat> you, first of all, I watch. Yeah, you have two kinds of um, sight, vision. Vision. Yeah. You either see right in front of you or to the side. Right. And you have a blind spot. Mm-hmm. And. I favor my right eye, right. and your mind combines both images, and we have two eyes to see better depth. All right, very good. Jason, I have a very simple thing for you to do. Put your fingers out like that in front of you. Okay. Okay. Here is a meter stick. I would like you to put one finger here and the other finger here, uh, no, go the other way. Put that one way over here, and right. this one over here. And you bring them together about right there, and I'll catch the ruler. All right. This finger won't move. Now, you trying to move it? Yeah. It... Now it's moving a bit, but I've passed the mark. Yeah, you passed the mark. Go ahead, finish up. Where are you going to end up? Right in the middle, at 50. Right, yeah, right in the middle. See if you can figure out what's happening. Regardless of where you start, let's start that finger over here like this. All I won't right. bother to catch the ruler because it's not going to fall. Bring them together quickly. Where do you end up? Ended up in the middle again. Yeah. Now see if you can figure out why. You know about friction and pressure? The more pressure there is between two objects, the more friction there's going to be. So now can you figure out well, why you can't move that finger? And well, when it was like this, and this finger had more weight on it because this one was closer to the end, mm -hmm. and this one was near the center, farther in, yeah. and so that makes more weight putting on that finger, and right. it creates more friction. Okay, so this one can move then. But this one can't get. Okay, then what happens? Well, when it gets evened out, this, they're both supporting the same weight, and they'll both move. Well, did you notice how it went back and forth just a little bit? It transferred the weight from one to the other until they were... Yeah, like you try to move one finger and then the other one will move. Right. Like that. So this is a nice trick to play on your friend. All you need is a meter stick or a yardstick to put them beyond us of where you start. Tell them to end up at some place other than the middle and they won't be able to do it because how no matter where you start, you always end up in the middle. Watch. 